Hello, and thank you for joining us on the West Ohio Sports Network. Time for another week of Press Row, and we've got almost the usual cast of characters <laughs> today. We've got Todd Walker, Zach Bowers filling in for Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz there on the end. I'm Matt Finkel. Big game. We've been talking about it since August, before then maybe. Coldwater marrying local this week. Who you guys got? Well, I'm, I'm sticking with Coldwater. That's been the tack all year. But <laughs> uh, interestingly, I got to talk with both coaches a little earlier this week, and you know, they, they each have an idea how maybe they can win the game. Uh, you know, Coldwater's worried about Marine Local has developed this uh, nice downhill running attack, and uh, they think they could be vulnerable there. And, you know, uh, Coldwater, though, I think has all the bases covered. They've been very good in the kicking game. Their offense has been explosive. Their defense is tremendous. Uh, I think Marine Local's MO it will have to be power ground game control the clock if they want to win but uh, if I had to make a pick which we are I'm going with Coldwater. Well I know this there's going to be a lot of fans in Delphis rooting for Coldwater <laughs> on Friday because people are already thinking to themselves this is Marin Local they've got a long winning streak if St. John's is lengthy state record winning streak is going to endure then they uh, need Coldwater to beat Marin Local this week to do that. And streaks are something a little bit uh, touchy. You don't <laughs> necessarily want to talk about them too often, but they're always lingering out there. I, I think I've been impressed with Coldwater's defense the entire season long. Their first string defense has not allowed points. The points they've given up have come late in games, and the second stringers have come in. But I go back to the way Marin Local is able to dominate the Minster contest by keeping the ball away from Minster. Hmm. If that Marin local offense can continue to grind out those long yardage drives, those time consuming drives, that downhill running attack and picking up four yards every play. So it's, it's nothing, no big gainers, but just keep on grinding it out and keep the ball away from Coldwater. That might be the recipe for Marin local success. But, but I think Coldwater is going to snap that winning streak. I'd go with Coldwater too, but that's an interesting point by both of you. A high power offense in Coldwater, but if they don't have the ball, then that's pretty hard to score points. So it's going to be interesting, but always fun every year to see. It's a lot of fan fear surrounding this game. Should be a lot of people at Cavalier Stadium. I think this game's going to be won in the trenches, similar to what you said. We'll see how the running game plays out. But Marion Local has some big guys, and they are starting to <laughs> be coached up to hmm. reach their potential. I think maybe something we didn't see early on in the season. So as we expected, the Flyers are playing some of their best football heading into this game, which I think, although Coldwater seems like the favorite right now, I can't go against Marion Vocal at this point. So Well, and there's also a nice little undercard in the MAC this week yes. as well. Yes, for recovery, right? Yeah, for recovery plays Minster. Yeah. I was talking to Don Kemper, and, he, and I was saying you'll be at Coldwater Marion. I'm assuming he's like, well, we've got for recovery Minster that week too. It's a big week in the MAC. Yeah. So league title and then also obviously playoff implications on the line. Playoff implications on the line also in the NWC this week, but we're going to look ahead to week 10 where we think the league will be decided just like it was last year between Spencerville and Delphus Jefferson. Both teams undefeated in league play currently will either trip up before that matchup at the end of the season. Uh, you wouldn't think so. Uh, if you but look at the odds. who saw Bath beating St. Mary's last right. week? <laughs> well, you know, that was a great matchup of styles there, and, and Bath had their, had their number, and the, and the Wildcats had been close to a couple of wins. But I, I think right now Spencerville's really on a roll, and Jefferson has uh, gotten back on a roll as well. I'd be surprised if either one of them lose before their Week 10 matchup. But that being said, we've seen some good balance in the NWC this year. Spencerville will have to go to Allen East the week before they play Jefferson. They also have a matchup with Bluffton this week, but Bluffton appears to be on the downslide right now. But I think both of them will remain league undefeated uh, heading into Week 10. Well, I think the fact that the Bearcats have already beaten Ada, have already beaten Columbus Grove, mm -hmm. I think those are probably the two biggest obstacles of getting to Week 10 without a loss. So. I, I, Jefferson still has to play those two teams, obviously, but I, I think I think we are going to see uh, undefeated in league play, Spencerville undefeated in league play, Jefferson in Week 10, which, you know, as if that game needed any more you know, fire to that rivalry. And I can attest to that being a Spencerville alum, excited for that game. I think that after after this weekend, uh, Delphus Jefferson plays Columbus Grove. I think after they get through that, um, I'm guessing that we'll see two undefeated teams as well because um, I, I don't know if Allen East is... It's going to be up to the task of Spencerville, but uh, it'll be interesting to see. I'm excited for that Week 10 matchup. 
How about the way the Bearcats won this week with pass three for four? Yeah, Mason yeah they won all Eric Coriel on us with four passes and uh, three of them for touchdowns, right? His quarterback rating was off the charts. Yeah, yeah. It was the interception nine. too. He had an interception on defense. So. So right, he had a big one at the end yeah. of the half. Happened right. to be there for that. And Grove, that was a, a good game, especially for the first half. And then Spencerville pulled away in the second. That interception was huge because Grove was going to possibly take the lead before the half. But Coach Zerby said they had 10 guys in the box and they were daring <laughs> us to throw it. And he can throw it. Nurse can throw it, yeah. clearly. So we'll see if that's something that they're forced to do more as the season goes along. But we're looking so those seven-on-seven seven seven passing camp Spencerville goes to in <laughs> July finally paid off? I guess so, yeah. <laughs> if, they need, if they need to, they can do it. All right, let's, you guys mentioned the St. Mary's bath game. The WBL has, has been wild all year. How many playoff teams are going to come out of the Western Buckeye League when, it, when it's all said and done? I got four. I think it's a little high. I, if I'm going to switch it, I would go down to three, I think is what you're <laughs> thinking. But I think four can get in. Uh, OG is going to be in. Wapak's going to be in. I think St. Mary's is pretty solid going to be in. Salina's the one that might, might not get in. I know Bath is still alive, but I, I don't think they're going to get in, even if they went out. They still need some help. So I'm, I'm going with... You're three and a half, you're over under here. I, I'm going to go slightly <laughs> over. I'm say they're going to get four. But see, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago on the Countdown to Kickoff show on WIMA that the way the WBL is structured with playing nine conference games, you don't have a chance to play that second non-conference game. And it's yeah. done wonders for the MAC when the MAC picked up that second non-conference game. Maybe it's time for the WBL to really take a hard look at that. Maybe it's time to start going to just the eight conference games, pick up a second non-conference game, chance to pick up some points, and get more teams into the postseason. Yeah, it's a good point, but, and this isn't to denigrate the WBL at all, but I think the MAC did it because they knew if they got more teams in, they'd win more playoff games. Well, the games. MAC did it because yeah. Parkway went eight and two, lost to the two eventual state champions, right. and didn't make the postseason. Right. Right. It, it, you know, if you're in the WBL, uh, most years, if the fourth or fifth team of the WBL gets in the playoffs, they're probably going to lose in the first round. It's not like in the MAC. If we get our sixth or seventh place team in, they're going to play Mechanicsburg or um, Covington or somebody and beat them like they do all the time. So that's why the MAC did it. I don't think the WBL really is in a hurry to do that, although your point is well taken. They probably could squeeze out another playoff berth or two if they eliminate a league game. Is OG a lock this year? What's different from this year as opposed to last year when they went 8-2 and two and didn't get in? Is their region worse? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the projections right now, I, I can't compare it by memory to how it worked out last year, but they're in a very advantageous position, assuming they don't lose a game they're not supposed to or something weird. If things hold the form, they should be in. Okay. All right, let's go to Major League Baseball. The playoffs started on Tuesday night with the Astros defeating the Yankees in the AL wild card game. Who's going to win the World Series? Mark, I know you got one. Who you got? <laughs> well, you know, I, I was looking at the matchups. Now, part of me would really love to see Houston and Texas meet in the ALCS. But also, I'd really love to have a r retro ALCS and have the Blue Jays and the Royals meet just like they did 30 years ago. And potentially in the National League, we could have the Cardinals and the Dodgers just, just like, like we 30 had years 30 ago. years ago. Really odd the way that's kind of worked out. But, uh, I, Matt, I, I think the Mets pitching is going to take them all the way. No, you don't. Wow. Oh, come on. Wow. You're, you're, you're <laughs> no way. way. No. Really? I, you're flattered. I feel that way, too, but I'm not when you get into the When you get into the playoffs, <laughs> yeah. it's about pitching. So who's got the but best But the Dodgers have pretty good pitching, too, though. That's what I'm worried about. Dodgers have got two good pitchers. Yeah. Our, our four that we're going with, I think, are stronger. But, you know, Harvey missed his workout on, on Tuesday, and now, like, you know, he's just been a headache. If we could have started him in game two and let Syndergaard pitch at home, I think I feel much better about our situation. But <laughs> overall, I'm excited to just be back in the postseason as a Mets fan. And honestly, I think the Royals are, might be the team that's kind of just been in that even keel the entire season. They've built on what they did last year. It very well could be, like 30 years ago, Kansas City Royals could be taking on the World Series title. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I, I, if I can pick a World Series champ, but I'll tell you who I'm rooting for. I'm rooting for Toronto <laughs> because they can finally be one of those teams. You know, they always say good pitching shuts down good hitting in the postseason. Well, the Blue Jays' offense was historically better than the rest of baseball this year, like top five ever in run differential from their top spot to the number two. So I'd like to see them bash their way to a World Series championship, especially in this era of pitching dominance 
I'm pulling for the Blue Jays, and I'm also pulling for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Their recent renaissance has seen them be the wild card for a third straight year. They win 98 games and have to play a one and done. By the time this airs, they could already be done. Yeah. But I'm I'm rooting for Pittsburgh this year. We're taping this on Wednesday, but you can tell you can know one thing that the atmosphere in PNC Park is gonna they're going yes. with the blackout. It's gonna be fun. On. Plus, I gotta figure uh, the Pirates have been through the cauldron of the playoffs. The Cubs think they're ready. They're not ready. They're young. They, they might win this game with Pittsburgh, but I don't think the Cubs have what it takes just yet to go all the way. All right, let's close with a question that I've actually given a lot of thought to, and I think you're probably the most qualified to answer, but we'll all give our opinion. Does this involve eating? No. <laughs> oh. No. Then we could use Andy for that, yeah, too, okay. if we had eating. But which sport, in your opinion, is the most difficult to offici officiate? All right, well, since I do officiate <laughs> softball and, but nothing else, I, I will go. I've always thought basketball is the hardest to officiate. There are so many things that can happen that affect play that should be called that you don't call or you do call. There's so many little things and uh, the fans are literally right on top of you, which they also are in baseball and softball. But uh, the intensity and the speed and the just all the factors of a basketball game, I've always thought basketball would be the hardest. I would agree with you. And, and for that reason, because of the speed of the game, you have to make that call in a split instance of a second. And then of course, nobody's ever happy when you do make the call, you've messed it up one way or the other. But I do want to propose one question. This has always been something I've wondered about. In football, I've always found it incredibly odd that it all comes down, as far as ball placement, to that sideline, that line judge's eye and his perception of where the ball got. Does anyone else find that interesting that it could be a matter of, you know, a few inches or so, which could be a factor in a major game, and it comes down to one man's who, what he saw as far as how far the ball was progressed. Well, you, you go to like a punt out of bounds. Yeah. No official yeah, knows it's exactly. It's completely imprecise. Yeah. Yeah. So much football is very imprecise mm. into the, where we're going to place the ball, yet we bring out the chains and we right. measure to see exactly how precise. <laughs> it's a game of inches, right? They need yeah. three chain links, but you know, football, the, sort of the complexity of some of the rules in football, as we mm -hmm. saw even this week in the NFL. But I'm going to go with soccer. You got a lot of distance you have to cover. You've only got two guys out there, sometimes three, so trying to judge everything. And I think a lot of soccer's judgment calls, like a lot of 50 50 calls, are going to go either way. And you talk about fans being right on top of you. Well, they're right on top of you in soccer as well. Plus, you can usually hear the fans in soccer <laughs> a little bit better than in some of the other sports. I'll, g I'll give you that. Uh, but you, I think if you bring in the complexity of the rules, I think football is becoming. Hmm. more difficult uh, to officiate. There's more judgment calls there, now. And there's a lot more judgment calls and there are a lot more rules. They just keep creating more rules <laughs> that you didn't used to have to do. But uh, I, I, I'll tell you another one that would be hard. We don't see much around here except when we see the jackets on TV. <laughs> hockey. Those guys you have to know work. How to skate for Those That's guys true. work. Go to a hockey game sometime and watch the officials, especially the guys on the sides. They about get run over every other trip down the ice, and they have to work hard. Uh, I'd say hockey would be a tough one, too. High school baseball came to mind just because, you know, when in the pros now they need the replay, and we need to have six looks at it. And I know the speed of the game is a lot, le a lot slower mm -hmm. in the high school level, but that doesn't mean the plays aren't as close, where you have to make a split-second decision on a hmm. tag. Did he get him? Did he not? You have no replay. Right. You're on your own. And there's so. only, well, in the regular season, there's only two guys to cover a high school diamond, right. which is the same size as a major league diamond. Yeah. Yeah. I it, mean, a home plate umpire tough. makes infinitely more decisions than, yeah. say, yeah. the linesman in football or some of the other officials. Sure. So uh, certainly there's a lot of decisions being made by that home plate umpire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say that being the plate umpire is probably the the most tedious of all those jobs because every play you make a call at least <laughs> ball and strike yeah, you can and then you can have angry. fair and foul yeah. out and safe there could be all kinds of things so it, it does become a bit tedious in that way but uh, they're all difficult that's why i don't see a whole lot of people uh, getting into <laughs> jumping it jumping in front of the maybe line. you can report back when you get it back out in the spring for there you go yeah. Yeah. <laughs> after i blow a few calls i'll come back <laughs> and let you know but the fans yeah. the fans will let you hear it i'm sure well, that does it for this press row. Thank you for joining us. Check the schedule online to see which broad rebroadcast games we'll have for you this week. It's highlighted by that Coldwater Marion game, which can be seen at 11 p.m. on WTLW. We'll see you next week.